Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2,123 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Today we continue with our ongoing series of messages that I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This message is week 5 on a 14-week series from the book of James titled, Wisdom is Faith in Action. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. Today we're going to continue our series in James, Wisdom is Faith in Action. And as we continue this series on the Proverbs in the New Testament, which I refer to as the book of James, or the letter from James, last week we focused on listening and doing good. And this week we're going to cover a hot topic in our, in our current society, but it's even more important that we focus on it in our church. Our focus is on partiality and prejudice. So join me on page 1881 and then going on to 1882 in your pew Bibles or in the Bible that you might have or phone. And as we read the scripture today, James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Once again, it starts at 1881, right at the bottom of the page in our pew Bibles. My, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, you must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into a meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy cl old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the one wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit at the floor on my, by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourself and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my brothers and sisters, God has not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and, and inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. Have not, but you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich you are, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble, noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, have you not become a lawbreaker? Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. In many of our Christian lives, we wrestle against a form of Christianity where we're obsessed by externals. Too many believers draw too quick a conclusions about people that they meet merely on their first impression. Almost as if they've forgotten what we're told in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, where it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by the appearance of it or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearances, but the Lord looks at the heart. Almost subconsciously, our prejudices form in our minds when we see those who claim to be Christ followers, whether here or as we meet outside. Or if someone walks into the church, we may think, her hair is just too short for my liking, or his hair is just way too long. They shouldn't be wearing that to church. What's with that guy's tattoos? He drives an expensive car. I hear they live in this huge mansion. He has a PhD. He didn't even graduate from high school. That family goes, sends their kids to public school. Or that family over there is homeschoolers. Prejudice. Our English word stems from a Latin noun that emphasized prejudgment of someone, causing us to form an opinion before knowing all the facts. And once we've raced to our conclusion about that person, ignoring the essential facts, we're well on our way to establishing an irrational and insidious attitude 
which says, I've made up my mind. Don't confuse me with the facts. And the whole point of James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, is to diffuse this kind of faulty thinking. James was a master communicator. And he speaks, first states his principle in verse 1. Then he provides a real-life illustration of that principle in verses 2 through 4. Next, he explains why such a behavior is inconsistent with the authentic Christian faith. And then he ends with the final exhortation to do what is right in verses 12 and 13. James begins by saying, in essence, faith in Christ and partiality and prejudice are incompatible. It's like this jar, if you can see, oil and water. Oil and water, I can shake it till I'm blue in the face, but what will happen? The oil will always rise back to the top because oil and water do not mix and cannot mix. And that's what James is saying here in this passage, is prejudice and partiality and our Christian walk should never mix. It's like oil and water. It's impossible or should be impossible in our lives. The command in this verse is straightforward. It literally says, you must not show favoritism. And James addresses the Christian call to those who he says are my brothers and sisters, who already have faith in Christ. The issue is not whether they believe or not or whom they trust. James uses some of the most exalted language for Christ in this passage where in this brief statement he says, our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. To think about it, this was James's brother who for many years until he was an adult despised Jesus. Now he's calling him our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. So their theology was correct. They were part of God's forever family. That wasn't the issue that we're dealing with here. But something was wrong. The attitude that accompanied their faith just didn't fit. It was like oil and water. They were mixing it together when it should never have mixed. The Greek word is translated personal favoritism, which is a compound word that communicates the idea of receiving the face. Like you're looking at somebody in their face and making up your mind about that person just because of what they look like in their face. And what a great way to put it. You see a person's face or their appearance and you receive an image as if that was the true image that we were supposed to have, the real thing. It's the word that is used in the New Testament in reference to God in Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. God judges the truth is this matter by the heart, not by the face. And as Christians called to reflect this quality in their own lives, and we're to do so because we're imagers of God. We're to reflect God's image, so we have to reflect how God looks at a person. And it's at their heart. What's the core of that person? I do have a word of clarification that's in order, though. Partiality and prejudice can go in two directions. It can be positive or negative. By merely looking at the outside characteristics, we miss a fatal, fatal flaw. We see, might see a person who is masked by their attractive attire, somebody who's tall and handsome or beautiful. They might have smooth speech, smooth talk. They are very well spoken. They might have a firm handshake, which is in most cultures, and including ours, sort of a sign of manliness. On the other hand, we can too quickly condemn a person based by their outward appearance. Failing to see their Christ-like character and the abundant spiritual fruit that composes that person's true identity. So James isn't questioning the importance of a, of a wise character study. We need to discern whether a person is true or not but our first impression of a person or grouping people together and saying, I judge all of them because they're in this particular group. So James isn't questioning that. We should all exercise the kind of discernment where we look at a person's heart to see what their true intent is. But instead, James here is addressing 
the problem with prejudice, a judgment made before carefully understanding what a person is truly like. And as we move on to verses 2 through 4, like windows that allow light to flood into a home and display its beauty, illustrations open up our hearts to allow us to flood into us understanding of what the scripture means. And James is a masterful illustrator. He doesn't leave his readers saying, well, don't treat this person one way and this person another. He tells us a story that we can relate to. Now, the setting for this illustration is an assembly. And it isn't the ecclesia referring to the church, but synagogue, which means in its base form, meeting. And the word synagogue comes from that. It refers to any meeting, just not the Jewish synagogue. Early Jewish Christians were sometimes able to meet in the Jewish synagogues, but still before long in the first century, the unbelieving Jews decided that they couldn't tolerate those ones, those Jews that were accepting Jesus as the promised Messiah, and they kicked him out of the synagogue. But wherever those believers then went and met, whether it was in their homes or another convenient meeting place, the term synagogue described their meetings. And we apply this verse in our day to an assembly of believers, whether it's here at church or whether it's outside, whether it's in some other building. It represents a place of worship or fellowship. And James illustrates two men that stand out in the church. The church that's gathering for worship. One is dressed to the nines. This person is dressed mighty fancy. And he has on the, well, the, the clothing of a very rich person. The fancy jewels to a, a, of expensive, elegant clothing. And this was an outfit similar to what they wear and wore in that day in the ancient Near East. And it was customary for people of great wealth or nobility to wear the jewel-studded clothing that you see here. It's made of fine silk fabrics. The garments announced that they were influential, powerful people who could change the actions of the day just with a nod of their head. But sometimes, something about this illustration would have hit those first century believers sort of odd. Because James wrote in his letter that the story was usually reversed. Christians were often brought into the assemblies of those who were rich to interrogate them and to judge them because they were believers. Typical of the wealthy and respectable, they rarely show up in the churches even of our day. So having caught the reader's imagination with the elegant robe of a rich person that we see here, James then moves on in his illustration. And he talks about the next person. This is my chainsawing clothes. <laughs> the poor man is in grubby, soiled clothes, and he wanders into an assembly. A group of believers in his clothes hang on his skinny form. This person has no jewels, no silk, no entourage to protect him from thieves or assassins of the day. This person doesn't influence anyone. Please note, this isn't referring to an average person that might wander into our church or any other church. This talks about somebody who even by a poor people's standard would be considered very poor. And this is what James is getting across here. One that stands out even to ordinary people, person as an exceptionally poor, just as somebody dressed in the rich person's garments, we would consider exceptionally rich. So this leaves a situa situation for the greeter of the assembly, whether it would be a synagogue or a church outside of that in the early years, that the decision that they had to make when they saw one of these two people walk into the assembly, what should I do? And it's, they don't really have time to think. And that's where our heart is. How are we judging these people by their outward appearance? And that's where our true character shines through. In James' illustration, the greeter is blinded by the one who wears the bling in verse 3. The rich man gets the VIP treatment. And I'll ask you to take your bulletins into today, or your insert in today's bulletin, 
And look at the layout we have here. As a rich person that comes into the assembly, this is a picture of what a synagogue would look like. It rows along here, and the speaker would come and take a scroll from the tabernacle in the back of the synagogue, and then he would sit in the place of honor, in the chair, and then he would read. And we remember Christ took the role of Isaiah and sat down and read Isaiah and said, Today, this prophecy is fulfilled. So this person in the chair, the bema seat, is the person who is speaking, reading from the scrolls. And what would happen when a rich person would come in? And James saw this was happening. Well, the greeter would take that rich person and says, sit here in the place of honor. Because the closer you got to the bema seat is the more important you were. And this is described in Matthew chapter 26 or 23, verse 6. They love to sit in the seat at the head tables at the banquet and the seats of honor in the synagogues. And this is what the rich person would be, they were doing with the rich person, seating them in a seat of honor as if they were something special. The tabernacle is where they usually met, and this is what they would do. The best seats is nearest to the bema seat or the pulpit. The rich man was shown that seat of honor, but the poor man doesn't even get a seat. Instead, the poor man, they would tell him, well, just go over here. You might sit on the floor or be at my feet. Just, um, you know, really stay out of the way. Instead of by the bema seat, something special, they were cast to the side so that people wouldn't notice them. Now, let me make something clear that James isn't, is not saying what James is not saying in this passage. The illustration is about one who is judging a rich man as better than a poor man. It's not about being rich or about being poor. There's nothing necessarily wrong with being rich. If God has provided you with those resources, then praise the Lord for that. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with being poor. The problem that James is addressing is a motive that affects our behavior, and it's about prejudice and partiality. In James chapter 2, verse 4, he announces the verdict. The greeter is guilty of discrimination because he's made the distinction and has become the judge without really understanding the person's heart. Maybe he set the person, the rich person, in a place of honor, thinking that he might win some sort of personal favor with an influential politician of the day. Instead, perhaps, maybe even less personal, but just as insidious as the greeter envisions, maybe this, a significant financial contribution to the church could come from the wealthy person if he just gave him a place of honor. James couldn't be more transparent in his teaching of us today. This kind of prejudice is sin. There's one place where class, or class distinction should be abolished. It's in our places of worship. Discrimination over color or political persuasion or financial status or fashion or appearance or any other measure does not belong in the church. Either inside our doors or outside the doors, either in private or in public. And that moves us on to verses 5 through 11 where James shifts into our lower gear and explains why prejudice and partiality is unfit for the Christian. He gives us three reasons here, a theological reason, a logical reason, and a biblical reason. The first one, a theological reason in verse 5, God shows no partiality, so neither should the children. And the Apostle Paul really honed in on this when he wrote the letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. He says, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things of the world considered foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose the things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, 
things counted as nothing at all and use them to bring nothing what the world considers to be important. And as a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God doesn't look at us on the outside appearance to judge us, and neither should we other people. Then James brings the logical reason in verses 6 and 7, and he has two rhetorical questions, which reveals much of the situation in the Jewish, that the Jewish Christians found themselves in. First, the rich and powerful were often persecuting Christians, dragging them before the authorities, in verse 6. And second, the rich and powerful were blaspheming God's name, in verse 7. And if we read between the lines here, more than likely it wasn't the poor people that were involved with this persecution. So indiscriminately showing favoritism toward the rich and mistreating the poor in this situation doesn't make any sense at all. Why would you do that when you know the next day the rich person might drag you before their assembly? And thirdly, James gives us a biblical reason in verses 8 through 11. Finally, James points out to his readers of Scripture, which excludes all partiality, James is repurposing Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, where he says, where the Lord wrote, Do not seek revenge or bear grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, this sounds familiar to us. James' readers would have immediately recognized this verse from the Old Testament, and it's one that Jesus used in Matthew chapter 19, verse 19, where he quoted this verse exactly, in the verse of Leviticus 19, 18. And it was also the basis for the golden rule, which we studied during the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, verse 12. Do to others what you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Christ called this the second of all commands as the most important, the first one being love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But Paul dwells down on this or drills down on this even more so in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, where he flips this and says, this is the most important. He says, for the whole law can be summed up by this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Given the fundamental importance of what James calls here is the royal law, to break one of these laws is like breaking all of them, and vice versa. So in verse 11, James says, For the same God who said, You must not commit adultery, also said, You must not murder. So if you murder someone, but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. And what James is emphasizing here, if you say you are pretty good in your Christian life, but you don't treat your neighbor as yourself, you're breaking that royal law that he's given to us. And if you break that one law, you're breaking all of them. So we would be lawbreakers. For this reason, prejudice, which refuses to love all equally, is the transgression of the greatest commandment in the Bible. And we say, well, that's not as bad as murder or other things. If you break the law in one place, you break the law in all places. And then we move on to verses 12 and 13. James wraps up his indictment against partiality with an appeal to apply his teaching. Let Scripture be your standard, he says. Let love be your law. Let mercy be your message. Speak not and act not in a natural, superficial, cultural conditioning way, but speak and act in a way that makes believers keeping the law and not lawbreakers, not subjecting them to God's discipline. Now, believers we know and understand will not fall under God's condemnation because we're told in Romans chapter 8, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So it's not about whether you're condemned or not, but whether you'll be judged or rewarded on the conduct that you have within your life here on earth. James reveals the standard by which all believers will be judged Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. And the New Living Translation puts it this way. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember you will be judged by the law that sets you free. In context of verses 8 through 11, 
we know that the law that James has in mind here, it's the liberating, what he calls the royal law, that excludes all prejudice and puts away all partiality. And it's summed up in one simple phrase, love your neighbor as yourself. So how can we apply this to our lives? Well, first of all, we have to recognize that partiality and prejudice in our own lives, if we allow it to flourish, is sin. The old adage goes, the birds of a feather flock together, and how true that is. And it's even true in our churches, and you might say especially in churches where we see cliques form, or certain types of churches thinking they're better than other types of churches. We have large churches, we have small churches, we have young churches, we have old churches, we have formal churches, we have informal churches, we have downtown churches, we have suburban churches, we have inner city churches. Churches of all kinds, churches of all makeup. But if you look in these churches, they're composed of people that, in most cases, look the same, think the same, talk the same, and act the same. And the unfortunate thing is often we mistrust or alienate or dislike those churches are not like us because our church is, is superior. We may not admit it or even realize it, but it does happen. I think Putnam, and we've been not to a lot of churches, but to a few churches in our lifetime, Putnam has a love and a closeness that you don't find in very many churches. And I praise you for that, because it's important for us to have that type of attitude. But we need to be careful that we're not exempting ourselves from what James is teaching us here. Why has it been so difficult for Christians to take James' words about partiality and prejudice so seriously? We're okay with loving our neighbors as long as we get to choose which neighborhood they're living in. But James' words concerning prejudice and partiality should challenge our attitudes and actions and change what we do about it. And so finally, James concludes his passage, verses 1 through 13, with two ways to apply his words, these principles about prejudice in our lives. First of all, let Scripture, not our habits, be our standard. Verse 12. To an extent, we all have ingrained prejudices, no one can say I'm perfectly without prejudice because we all have prejudices in our lives. And we have to understand that so we recognize it. It's part of our nature. We've been taught it in school. We've been taught it in our families, among our friends, and even, unfortunately, from many church pulpits. But we have to call, what, call it what the Bible calls it. Anytime we are prejudging someone, we're thinking with a sinful thought. James says that prejudice and faith in Christ do not mix any more than oil and water mix. Prejudice and our faith in Christ cannot mix. We need to be quit holding on to our prejudices and hiding behind our flimsy excuses. Well, that's just the way I am. That's the way I was taught. That's the way I was brought up. And although... The whole idea of prejudice and racism and dividing people is a political hot potato today and is being fueled by our current society and even some of our leaders, I'm sad to say. And our current society and social media is so rife with it. And it's packaged in that dangerous concept of critical race theory. But we need to strip away all those concepts and just follow what the scripture teaches. It doesn't matter what ethnic, economic, or political group somebody belongs to. They could be white or black. They could be Hispanic or Arab. They could be Asian or Palestinian or Jewish. They could be rich or they could be poor. They could be right or they could be left. They could be Republicans, they could be Democrats, they could be white collar, they can be blue collar. We need to overcome our prejudices and biases against others. And we need to decide right now to agree with what Scripture calls it 
If we're prejudiced against someone else, then it is sin. The second application James has is let love be your law in verse 12. James calls this the command to love your neighbor as yourself. He calls it the royal law in verse 8 and the law that sets you free in verse 12. And when we encounter people different from us, when we will, whether they're older or younger, lighter or darker, richer or poorer, ones that follow the traditions we do or don't follow them, we need to resist the question, how far away can I get from this person as possible and as quickly as possible? Instead, we must answer the question, how can I best love that person both in word and in action? How can I help them? How can I build that person up and encourage them? How can I show grace and mercy instead of discrimination and partiality? It's hard for us. People that don't grow up the same way we do or come from a different culture than we do, it's hard for us to make that transition. But that's what James is calling us to do. And as we seek to apply James' message, ask God to reveal to you, as I do need to for me, where I might be guilty of favoritism or partiality. And at the same time, we need to ask for discernment to make accurate distinctions about how to love, whom to trust, and when to confront someone. James isn't saying that we must treat every soul on earth exactly the same, but we can't mistreat people simply based on their superficial prejudices that we might have. We need to understand where the person's coming from. We can't look at one group of people and say, well, I don't like them because they're from a certain area of the world where terrorism reigns. There's Christians among all of them, and there's people that need Christ among all of them. One thing that really gets my, sticks in my gullet, my craw, is when the media and the government officials play race against each other. We're one human race. There are no different races. Yes, there are ethnic groups within that race, but we're a human race. There's no differences in God's sight between any of us. And we need to look, even at those that disagree with us, in a way, how can I encourage and encourage them and help them? How can I love them or show the love of Christ to them? And if we approach each person we meet as an opportunity to demonstrate that love, we will make good progress in putting away prejudice and partiality from our mindset. Next week, we'll extend this topic as we move on to James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, and the title will be Faith at Work. That means faith in our life, which mirrors the theme of this entire series, Wisdom is Faith in Action. And I'd ask you to read that passage in preparation for next week, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, Faith at Work. And think today how we can love others and not be prejudiced against them. Let us pray. Father, we humbly come before you, knowing that I have prejudices in my life that I need to do away with and overcome, Father. As with each of us, it's, we struggle for people that aren't just like us, people from different countries or different nationalities or different, different ethnic groups or different political persuasions, we're too quick to rise up and condemn everyone when we need to love everyone and then be discerning on those that we might be able to help even further. Help us apply these principles to our lives each day as we move forward, that we might please you, that we might love our neighbor as ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, 
lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.